Psalm 37. Uh, yes, yeah, Psalms 37. Verses, I'm going to look at verses 23 and 24. Psalm 37. Verses 23 and 24. If you take notes, I've entitled a message, A Helping Hand, A Helping Hand. Thus saith the Lord, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Let's bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to help us with this uh, this message. Spirit of God, we come in thanksgiving for all of your word. And here, Lord, we have a promise, we have providence, and we have strength. And as we look into the verse, pray, God, that you would open up our ears and our hearts and help us to find an application we can use in our life, something we can leave here with this morning and, and, uh, and apply to our lives today, tomorrow, or whenever. Just help us to find something that we can use. And if there is one listening today who knows not Christ as Savior, Lord, pray that, that this message would stir their heart and that you would be willing to call them to yourself. Oh God, we know that uh, your word does go, goes out and does exactly what it's meant to do. So we thank you for that and we ask you for that and a blessing. All that we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds his hand. These two verses have within them those three points. God's providence, God's pleasure, and God's power. They are, above all, God's promises to, to you and I, to every believer. It's his promise that every single step you take in this life is ordained by his perfect will. I have a proof verse for you. Proverbs 16.9 backs that up. A, man, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. That means our lives are not ruled by chaos, chance, or coincidence. There are none of those things. If there's a God, a sovereign God, and this is his world, then he is orchestrating everything in this world because he is the supreme being. That's what the word God means, nothing higher. And that includes luck, chance, or coincidence. That means our life, because there is no luck, chance, or coincidence, and because there is a God in this world, and because of that, our life has a purpose. You know, I wasn't always a Christian, and for those of you who are, neither were you. At one time, we were like the rest of the world, unsaved, a carnal na having a carnal nature, acting on it. Everything was about the flesh. Everything was about desire. But there came a day when that changed, and when it changed, it was a mighty change in all of us. And we came to know Christ as our Savior, and when that happened, everything changed. You can go from Paul, who was a Pharisee, who was out crucifying and even uh, being an accomplice to the murder of saints and thinking he was doing it in righteousness. But then when he was called by God, he knew that there was a Lord and he wasn't in the law. He was in heaven and his name was Jesus Christ. And his life changed. And because his life changed, he, God gave him the power and the, and the skills to write this book. And because of him and this book, our lives changed. We have a purpose now. We're not like these little foxes that run around and every day all they want to do is have a meal. They don't want to get eaten up or hurt. They want to go back to their warm den and sleep. And then the next day they want to do it and they want to do it the next day and the next day. That's what happens in life if you don't have a purpose. You're working for the boss. You're making money. You're planning vacations. There's no purpose to any of that. There's no goodness in that. It's all for the self. But with Christ, you have a purpose. 
It also means, our text also means, from, from birth to death, from the D-O-B to the D-O-D, God's hand is guiding our steps every, every moment. Every step you take is by his will, whether it's good or bad. Psalm 48 backs that up. He says, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. There's no books out there. You know, you have people who write about death experiences. Poppycock. They don't know anything about death because if they, they did, they'd be dead. And they wouldn't be able to come back and tell you anything about it. But there was somebody who did die and come back. And he, tell, he tells us everything about death. As a matter of fact, he has the keys to death. Now, what I just said, telling the Christian believers, but by the same token, it's also true that all those who are outside of Christ, whether they believe it or they want to, they want to know it or not, all the lost are directed by God's hand as well. There isn't one soul that's ever come into this world that wasn't under God's ordained will. Not one. I got a proof verse. Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, in the heavens, and his kingdoms, his kingdom rules over all. That means that means that he's in charge of everything. He rules over all in heaven and on earth. Whether you know Jesus Christ as your savior or you don't care about Jesus Christ at all, all of us are ruled by him. Now, how the Lord establishes his throne in heaven, and not only does he establish it there, he establishes it here, uh, there, he establishes it here, and he regulates his kingdom. How does he do that? It's called the hedge of protection. The hedge of protection is, if you go back to Genesis chapter 6, I'm thinking in verse 5, God said, It repents me that I've made man for his, his heart is continually evil. And he ultimately destroyed the world in a flood. What it was, was there was no hedge of protection. He let men have their will. And in doing that, we see that man's will is continually evil. So after Noah came, he made a pledge. He wouldn't destroy the earth that way anymore. And he put a hedge of protection around all men, the lost and the saved. He did that to keep them sane, to keep them from being uh, for doing the same things that uh, that the people did in Genesis, starting in chapter 6. Now, since most of the world has rejected his offering of his son's sacrifice for their sins, the hedge of protection around them is very minimal. It's just high enough to keep them from, well, I wouldn't even say that now. I say the way our world is going now, if you look around, is it not insane? As I look around here, there's no young people to speak of. But all of us here are living in, in a sense, we're living in Egypt. I don't know this world. And I don't think you do either. It seems like every time things seem to get, is, uh, we see that things are bad, they just get worse. So the hedge of protection around America specifically is being lowered. Now, for those who think that things are getting better, you're just deceiving yourselves. Go on the internet, pick up a newspaper. You'll see things are not getting better. That's an important distinction, too. He regulates it with that hedge of protection, and it's minimal. And that level of protection means that God is allowing those who are outside of Christ to be ruled by their carnal appetite. That's really what's happening. They're being ruled by their carnal appetite. Everything is about them. Everything is about the flesh. It's about desires, lust, those things that we need. I'm not referring to sexual things. I'm thinking lust in general. Contrary, why? Oh, and here's a verse for that. Romans 124. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to an impurity. I don't think there's been a time, even, even when Sodom and Gomorrah were here, that man has been more impure than he is today. I don't think man has ever been as carnal as he is today. 
Now, contrary to that, God's hedge of protection around his people is quite high. So they are ruled and they are guided by his love and his kindness. Isaiah 58, 11. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like the watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Now, I got to tell you something. I don't, uh, I don't really dig into what's going on in the world, but I know what's going on in the world. And I know a lot of Christian believers who are unsettled by it, who are, who are just, some of them are even a little frantic about it. Like, what's going on? How could that happen? Da, 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 da. And they don't understand that. They don't grasp the idea. They don't grasp the idea that God's going on. That what's happening is happening because of God's will. And because I am a believer, I understand that. I grasp that idea. And I get great peace in understanding that. So when think, people tell me about these things that are happening, all these terrible things that are happening, I don't get all emotional. I don't get all carnal about it. I'm able to deal with it with a, with a sane mind. Why? Because I have the assurance above all things that the one who is righteous, incapable of doing evil, is in charge of it. And so for me, I don't get upset. I know it's happening. Do I like it? No. But I know it's happening for a reason. And that's the distinction between having a hedge of protection that's high. I'll give you understanding, the Bible says. That's understanding. But when it's low, you revert back to your natural nature, your carnal nature. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at our text. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, the first thing I want you to note is the term, the steps of a good man. The word good, if you look in your Bibles, is not in all translations. It just says a man in some of the translations. But in the New King James and in the King James Bible, it's in italics, which means it acknowledges the fact that it isn't in the original manuscripts or in all translations. And the interpreters of those Bibles used it to clarify exactly who David was talking to. Instead of just saying men, the term good man refers to a godly man, one who trusts in the Lord. That's a godly man. Psalm 32.10, he says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. That's exactly what I was saying about the way the world's going and how I feel about that. And how you should feel. If you're a Christian, you should feel no different. You should understand that this is something that's being done by God, and we have to accept that. We, are, we do not make anything any, uh, happen in this world we're just in charge of accepting what God puts in our lives. We don't change anything. Now look at the next section of the text. He says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The word ordered, that means they're, they're secured, they're fixed, or they're ordained in place. They're not going to change. They're immutable. Jeremiah 29.11. Turn there with me. Jeremiah 29.11. This is how you know he ordains your steps. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Before you were saved, you didn't have a hope. What was your hope? The next day. You just want to be around for the next day. Now I have a hope every day that I'll be a better person, a better Christian, and a better disciple of Christ every day. And I do the same things I would have done if I wasn't saved, I just do it with Christ. That's the distinction. That's the difference. And having that religion, having that understanding, everything changes. Everything changes. I, I, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plan, plans for welfare and not for evil, 
to give you a future and a hope. And one of the vehicles that God uses to, or, uh, to ordain our steps, a godly person's steps, one of the vehicles he uses is providence. Things You think things happen in your life by luck, chance, or coincidence? You think you, did you choose, uh, or do you think it was luck, chance, or coincidence that choose, chose when you were going to be born, who your parents were going to be, where you were going to live, what color your skin would be? Did you think that all those things happened just by luck, chance, or coincidence? It didn't. It didn't. Romans 8, 29 says that all, uh, 28 rather, or 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's what it means. He foreknew, the word foreknew means he loved before. He loved you in eternity past. Jeremiah 31, 11 says that. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And predestined means that he has set in place certain things to happen. You can look at your life now, whether you're lost or saved, you can look at that life and say, huh, that was connected to that, that was connected to this, and that led to this, and that leads to me he being here today. Or not. That's, that's providence. That's how it works. And also, another vehicle he uses, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our hearts. God's never come up to anybody, well, for quite a while now. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, it says that, that he no longer speaks to the as he did to the prophets, but he speaks through his son. This is his son's words right here. And he speaks to our hearts with this book. Now, that sounds strange. If you're lost, you say to yourself, wow, how could that be? He's reading a book and he's... he's He's getting voices in his heart. No, I'm getting influences in my life. And those are words to me because now I take what that influence is, which is always good, by the way. This Bible, there's nothing bad in this Bible. There, I, when I first was a Christian, I, I was so excited about God. I used to give a, I had a lot of friends that weren't saved. And I used to say to them, tell you what, you read any part of the Bible you want and you find something in there that's not good for me and I'll eat the whole I'll eat the whole book. I'll eat the whole New Testament, pages and everything. Show me one thing in here that's not good for me. Not one, that's it. And then show me another book that's as good as this one. That's as true as this one. Show me one. They're not there. Because there is none. They're all good. He speaks to our heart. Isaiah 30, 21 is my backup verse, Dan. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to your right hand or whenever you turn to your left, which one of you here have not heard that in your heart? How many times have you went home and all of a sudden you said, you know what, I think I'm going to go over there. Whoop. That's speaking to your heart. That's providence. You're supposed to turn there. And every single one of you who know Christ as your, as your Savior you are a living testimony to God's hand guiding your life. The fact that you're here today and there's nobody listening in, in this audience or online, there's nobody listening that wanted less of God in their life than me. I wanted nothing to do with God. I had it all when I was a kid. They, they, one, one side was Protestant, they pulled the ear this way. One side was Catholic, they pulled the ear this way. No wonder I got big ears. I had enough of God. Who wants that? I didn't believe in him. You know what I thought God was? He was a crutch for people that were weak. People that had given up and they didn't have the backbone to just, just stand up for themselves and get through it. And then I found out later that it wasn't that they didn't have a backbone. It was that they didn't have a heart for Christ. And that when you have a heart for Christ, even when I'm weak, I'm strong. That's what the Bible says. And I've proved it in my life many, many times. It's sort of like the, the Bible says Moses was meek, but he was the mightiest man that ever walked on this planet. He's the only one that parted the Red Sea, that ever parted water. Besides, well, Christ walked on it, but Moses parted it. So never confuse meekness with weakness. They're altogether different.
Hebrews 14 tells us that even before we were saved, even before God's people were saved, God was protecting us with his angels. Now, I'm not big on angels. I'm big on God. Angels are servants. And there are guardian angels that come to God's children when they're born. He knows who we are. It says that in Hebrews 1.14, talking about the spirits, uh, the angels, he says, and are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those, here it comes, who will inherit salvation? In the original Greek language, the, the, the verse is written in the future tense, which means before the worlds were formed, before all of us, be, I mean, before any of us were born, God knew who we were. And the moment we came into this world, we were assigned angels to watch us. Now, think about this. Now, speaking of believers now, or Actually, I don't know who isn't a believer, because even though you're not saved, I wasn't saved, but yet there were angels watching over me, making sure. And I can tell you the type of personality that I had. They had their hands full. And because our steps are ordered by God, I have victory every day in my life. I don't suffer defeats very often, and I'm not being proud. I'm stating a fact. The, the political scene doesn't defeat me. The medical scene doesn't defeat me. Nothing. The devil doesn't defeat He lived in my garage for two weeks one time. I mean, he just wouldn't leave me alone. It was like he was there constantly. There was something bad going on constantly. He didn't defeat me. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the, uh, that is, than he that is in the world. So that means that because I'm in Christ, he might be able to he might be able to give me a, a toss, but he ain't gonna toss Christ anywhere. That's the beauty of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. It makes this life so much sweeter. As bitter as it is, it just makes it sweeter. So I have victory. First Timothy 6 12. By God's hand, every believer will fight the good fight of faith. Every day I fight the fight of faith. Most of my family, uh, my blood family, outside of <laughs> Christ's blood family, you guys, they're not saved. So I have to go there, and 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 when I want to fellowship with them, but I have to always be very careful because I don't want to. I don't want to make myself hostile to them. I don't want them to to separate from me. So I've told them all about Jesus Christ. I said, I got to tell you this, it's in my heart. And if I don't do it, I'll never forgive myself. And whenever an opportunity arise, arises, I always uh, am, am on it. But generally, when I'm with my with my family or with other friends, I have some other friends that are not uh, that are not saved. I'm on I'm, I'm I'm just trying to love them enough. I want them to see in me the love I have for God and the love God has for me. I want them to see that the Brian that they used to know is gone. He's dead. And the new Brian is an altogether different person. And I have to tell you, there have been people who have come up to me and said that it was, it was the way I lived my life. Not what I said, but how I lived my life, uh, lived my life and sh shined my light that made them understand that I was a different person. And all they, although they couldn't understand it, they accepted it. We have the victory over everything in this life. The victory over the world, 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of the world overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Do you not understand that? That's why I don't care about what's going on. I, there's a message online, look it up. I care, but I don't care. And that message is very distinct because it tells you, I care because America, I joined the military. I put my name on the line as Mike did and as Newt did and a few others back in when Vietnam was going. And I said, let's go. Let's, this is America. We're going to stand for America. Let's fight for America. Now, I wonder how many of us would do it now. I wouldn't. There's nothing here to fight for. I love this country. But our country, our country is just changed in such a way it's become ungodly. And it's very difficult for them. 
We have the victory over the world. We also have victory over the bondage of sin. Romans 6, 14, for sin will not have dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. I'm still a sinner. I sin occasionally. I just don't practice it. I'm not bound to it. If you don't understand that, it simply means this. There's a new, there's, I'm under new management. I've been under new management for 27 years. And under new management means that I, I act different because I serve a different master. I don't serve myself anymore. I serve God and I serve everybody else that I can. And I'm the last one on the ticket. And I'm very good with that. Look at the last section of verse 23 in Psalm 37. David writes, he delights in his way. Now, some people think that he's talking about the godly man, but he's not. It's a reference to God's pleasure in watching our life being conformed to Christ's nature. What parent doesn't enjoy that? What parent doesn't raise a child and watch that and teach that child certain things and watch that child develop those things in their life and then take those things and add to them their own personality? But the basic foundation of what they're doing is what you instilled in them. That's another thing that's not in the households today anymore. Probably part of our problem. It pleases God when a child chooses obedience over sin. Did you know that if you don't know Christ as Savior, you don't know, you, there's no distinction for you? In other words, every time I go out into this world, or even if I'm, I'm just by myself, if something goes through my mind that's sinful, I stop immediately because I have two choices. I know what sin is because I know what's in this book, and I know what, uh, what uh, God's word says about that. So now I have a choice. Which one do I obey? I always, I always try to obey God's word. Do I do it all the time? No. And I repent of it immediately. But I can now choose that because I understand it. I'm not in bondage to it anymore. Before I, I never thought I was in bondage to anything before I was saved. Did you? No. I mean, why? I wasn't in bondage to anything. Maybe, a, maybe the Budweiser once in a while, but that's it. And the reason was because I was dead. I didn't understand good. I thought everything was the way it was. You know, there's a reason why the Bible says we're born again or reborn. There's a reason. Because it isn't a physical rebirth. It's a spiritual rebirth because we come into this world hostile to God to begin with. They have the victory over it now, though. In section 23, he's talking about delighting his way, being conformed. It pleases God when a believer loves God enough to truly forgive. I'll tell you what, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I think if the if one of the reasons the world is in such terrible shape is because people don't know how to forgive. They don't forgive. It's a carnal thing not to forgive. That's what I did. I didn't forgive and I I forgave if it was if it was something that it was all conditional, put it that way. Make peace. Okay, you know, you're sorry for that. Okay, don't do it again. Okay. I didn't forgive that person. I just said I did. Why? I wanted to make a, a, a series of peace. And that's if if you're honest with yourself, that's really what we do because we tend to hang on to things that when people offend us. You don't do that as a Christian. That pleases God. I've had the newspaper from, from Naugatuck to Canaan print an article about me being the Grinch who stole Christmas. And people would actually tell me, oh, are you the Grinch over there in Northfield? Yeah, I am. I am, thank you very much. Because I wouldn't allow Santa Claus in the church. That was the reason why. So, so yeah, I think that made God very happy that I did that. And he's also, he's also pleased when an elect suffers, and in the midst of suffering, he clings to God. And who better to cling to? Who do we have in this world, really, when you're suffering something emotional or something physical? Who do we have that we hold on to that can bring you any relief? Who can do it? Who? Your friend can might do it, might, you know, but they're going to leave. That's coming back. Or maybe you need a few bucks. Somebody can throw you a few bucks, but you're going to need a few more. Who can really, who can really bring comfort to a human being besides God? 
And keep in mind, he did create you, regardless of what you think. In summary, God delights himself in his children when they anchor their hope in heaven and they take hold of his hand. In verse 24, the uh, second part of the text, it, there's a promise that comes from pleasing God. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. The image here is that of a man on a journey and he stumbles or falls down. It's a metaphor for a godly person who is walking on a journey and stumbles on things like in their path like discouragement, disappointments, or difficulties. Those are all things that happen in life. And many, many people stumble on it. 1 Peter 4.12 talks about it this way. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Suffering in, in a Christian mind, suffering is a gift from God. Philippians 1.29, it is given unto you to suffer for Christ. And that word suffer in the original Greek language means it's a gift. Not suffer, but uh, given to you. It's a gift to suffer. Why? No pain, no gain. Same as the gym. Right, Angel? No pain, no gain. God puts something in your life. You can look at it two ways. You can say, yep, that's not good. It's going to leave a mark, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Bada boom, bada boom. You do all of that. Or you can say, Lord, I don't know why you put it in there. I'm going to have to, I'll probably have to shed a little blood on this one, but you know what? As long as I can hold your hand, I'm good. I'll go through whatever I have to do. Every so-called adversity that comes into your life was ordained. Did you know that? Now, now, some people would say, oh, that's horrible. Why would God ordain this or that or the other thing? I don't know. And I tell people that all the time. I don't know why he allows bad things to happen. But I know this. If you want to know how it, why, or you want the answer to that question, then come to Jesus. Come to the cross. Let him open up your mind and see if he gives you the answer. That's the best way. And when the text uh, promises that he shall not, uh, though he fall, he shall not be utterly class, uh, cast down, that means that we may fail, we may fail, and we may have fear in our hearts, but our text promises you won't be on your face very long. As a Christian, I've been knocked down quite a few times, actually. Some myself, some by other people, but I was never down very long. I actually got knocked down more as a Christian than I did as not a Christian. And it says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. That means in adver any, all adversity in a believer's life is a temporary event. There's not one person here that hasn't went through a major event in their life that they deemed an adversity. Not one. We all have. And yet we're all here today. We're here today. We got over it. The question is, how did you get over it? Was it something that you just said, oh, and you just, it was like you're carrying this thing. It's like, oh, it's been two months now, and I'm still carrying it. Some people never get rid of it. They never take the Velcro off. They never get rid of the past. The past is with them every day. Christians don't do that. We're told looking back is a sin. Why? Because you can't be thinking of today and yourself and God in that text, in that context, if you're looking back. And generally speaking, most people who look back, they ain't looking back at the good things as much as they are the bad things. And what good's that do you today? Nothing. Christians understand that. Do you understand what a state of mind is? That's the state of mind of a Christian. We don't do that because we know there's nothing in it that's good. And it's a temporary event. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but that which is common to man and with the temptation will come a way of escape that you will be able to, a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Scripture's filled, absolutely filled with God's promises of deliverance. Romans eleven twenty nine, The gifts of God and the calling of God are irrevocable. He can't, you can't, he doesn't take anything back. John 6.37, 
whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. Once you know Christ is your Savior, you can never become unsaved. They're just a taste of the promises. If you're sitting here this morning and you haven't accepted or you haven't received Christ as your Savior, what are you waiting for? How's life treating you? Is everything good? And if it's not good, how are you dealing with it? How much are you carrying? How much are you carrying around from last year, or maybe five years ago? How much have you let go? How much? I know very few people who live without Christ that aren't miserable in some way, shape, or form. That deal with problems in a very standard way. They'll go away. I'll take what I'll, I'll whatever it costs. I'll pay whether it's physical, financial, no matter what it is, I'll do all of that. And then it's done. But that's a lie. Because problems are never done. The only time problems get done is when they take our bodies and put them in the ground and our spirit and our, and our soul descends to one of two places. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, you don't have to believe this. You, don't, you may not believe it. You may not want to even know it. But the fact of the matter is that every culture since the history of man has believed in an afterlife of some sort. And Jesus Christ has come down to tell us the truth about that. And the truth is, when you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. That's it. And, and, and it's simple. You're not going for being bad. You're not going for the things that you did. You're going for one reason. Because you refuse the sacrifice of Christ. God sent his son to die for us. John 3, 16 lays that out very clear. For God so loved the world, things of the world, you and I, so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that simply means that I sent my son on that cross to die for every single human being to pay their sin debt to me. And you, all, of, all of us sin. And you're going to reject it? And you're going to live your life. You're going to live your life the way you want to live it. Without him. Well, then when you leave this world, the only thing you're going to take with you is your sins. And the only place those sins will go is in hell. That's a tough thing. I, I agree, it's a tough thing, but it's the truth. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Now, if you're sitting here and that's the case, and you may want to say, well, you know what? Maybe I want to change. Maybe I want to have a, an upgrade in my life. I certainly don't want to burn in a lake of fire. Well, all you have to do, this is the, this is the thing that amazes me ever since I was saved. The simplest thing in the world is to say you're sorry, is to say, you know what, Lord? That man was right. Your word is right. I am a sinner and I need a savior. And I want to repent of my sins. And I want to ask you, Jesus Christ, to come into my life and change my life. Make me like you. Would you do that? And you know what his answer is? Romans 10, 13. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Period. Don't care what you did. Don't care how long you did it. Everything is forgiven. Now I want to ask you something. How hard is that? And then the second thing I'd ask you is, if you were to go home, when on your way home today, I want you to think about this. What's keeping me from going to Jesus Christ? What's keeping me from doing that? And the answer is always the same. My desires, I don't want to give up my desires. I don't want to trust in anybody but myself. Now, ask yourself this after you think that. Is it worth, is it worth going to hell? Is it worth going to the lake of fire and burning forever? And Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and there is no rest day or night. Ask yourself that. But call upon the Lord. If you want to do that, you see me or call me, and I'll show you in his word how he wants you to, to come to Christ, to receive Christ, and to upgrade your life from just having a day-to-day -day existence, vacation of vacation, to a, to a life that has a purpose 
of helping you become a better person, a better Christian, and for you to shine your light into a world. You know what Christianity really is? It's people who, who receive Christ giving the love that God gave them to the rest of the world. That's really what evangelism is. Loving people enough to tell them the truth and, and hoping that they'll accept that. That's you, you see me. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, God is holding you in his hand because he loves you more than you could ever possibly know. You couldn't understand his love. He sacrificed his son. He's given you exceedingly and great promises. He's adopted you. He shares his household with you. And he makes you joint heirs in his kingdom. That's how much he loves you. And all he wants in return for you, Christian, is to grasp the helping hand he's reached out to you with a little tighter so your life will be more pleasing to him and easier for you. How do you do that? Simply by striving a little harder to be more holy, more righteous, and to let your light and your love shine in this terribly dark world. Is that too much to ask? Considering all that you have in Jesus Christ? Think about that on your way home, brothers and sisters. And I pray that the God of peace and grace will fill your heart and may his love strengthen your life and may you never let go of his hand. Grip it as tight as you can. It's a wonderful ride when you ride in salvation. Let's pray.